just going to give one more minute so we can get a few more people in. Again, we already have some uh, folks sharing greetings in the chat. Thank you so much for doing that, letting us know where you are calling in or listening in from. That would be great. Hello, Duan. Hello, Hadra. Is that Hadra? No, oh, this is Bilkis. Yes. Bilkis. Hi. Um, this is Hadra. Oh. Yeah, this is Hadra. Hi, Hadra. But I see Bilkis too. Hello. Wonderful. I'm so glad you could join us. Yeah. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Wonderful. I see some more greetings in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone. About 30 more seconds, and we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, so all right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I want to welcome you to the Washington Healthcare Facilities Community of Practice Initiative, our event for today. Um, so you've collected your Washington Healthcare Facility data, now what? a discussion about data for action. We are so very glad that you could join us today. I wanna to introduce myself and our teams. So I am Joanne McGriff, Assistant Professor within the Department of Global Health within the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, as well as core faculty within the Center for Global Safe Water, Sanitation and Hygiene um, here at Emory. I have with me Lindsay Denny, who is also with the Rollins School of Public Health, as well as Haley Elling from World Vision. We also have several members of our steering committee present who is uh, with us in the audience, um, as well as a great team of interpreters who will assist us today with Spanish and French speaking participants. In fact, I'll go ahead and ask you if you haven't already to please choose your language of choice in that bottom toolbar uh, on Zoom. We're asking you uh, to do this because one of our participants um, on our panel is going to complete their um, uh, their presentation in French. And so we just want to make sure everybody has their chosen preferred language in Zoom to allow for uh, easy transition. Um, so as always, today's session uh, comes out of a series of discussions among the community of practice steering committee, as well as other partners about the importance of data in Washington healthcare facilities. We're certainly looking forward to hearing from our panelists who have collected data related to Washington healthcare facilities and will share with us their experiences answering that now what question, right? That's associated with the title of this session. But before we go on, I want to take a brief moment to welcome those who are new to the community of practice meeting and provide some background as to who we are and what we do. And so we are an action-oriented learning platform that brings together the WASH and health communities to focus on policy, evidence, and practice in WASH and healthcare facilities. Our goal is to connect the expertise and experience of our partners and colleagues to members of the WASH and health community who have expressed interest in taking action in WASH and healthcare facilities. We also share uh, through this platform, as well as our newsletter and the web page um, that we have uh, so that we can provide resources to the WASH and health community. Because our goal is that after each session, uh, we want you to act, right? So that everyone should have tangible information that will allow you to take immediate steps to advance the improvement of WASH and healthcare facilities. So next slide. I also want to remind everyone of the guiding principles of this community of practice so that we know where we're coming from in these webinars or when you see our newsletter. Um, we full stop believe that WASH is a fundamental prerequisite for, the, for quality care within a healthcare facility and that there can be no effective IPC or infection prevention and control without adequate WASH. We also believe that the issues around WASH healthcare facilities is solvable 
um, but it will require all of us to work together. So there are multiple stakeholders, sectors and systems that really need to integrate and come together in order for us to have sustainable solutions. And then finally, that the community of practice that we have here welcomes everyone. So whether you are a seasoned expert in Washington healthcare facilities or someone for whom this topic is brand new, we're open to all uh, of, of you joining us and then all of us learning together and sharing and respecting the diversity of our perspectives, our backgrounds um, in, 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 in the way that we participate uh, on this forum. So next slide. So each time we meet, we try to feature a success story. So this is, you know, we've got so many things going on in Washington Healthcare Facilities. We really do need to hear um, good things that are going on. So we want to thank IRC Uganda for sending this success story regarding their IRC COVID Wash Plus project in Kabaroli District in Uganda. And initially, this program was focused, as many, um, over the last several years on the emergency, res emergency response to COVID-19. And so they were boosting supplies like PPE and alcohol-based hand sanitizer for all health workers. But then they were able to find a way to incorporate more sustainable solutions and really evolve the program to include things such as training uh, healthcare workers on IPC and cleaners on their role in preventing the spread of hospital acquired infections or HCAIs. And then now medical waste is being managed thanks to the first licensed medical waste incinerator that serves all of the healthcare facilities in that particular district. So that is a huge success that we do wanna celebrate with IRC and encourage you all. We accept them at any time during the month. If you have a success, no matter how great, how small you think it is, we all want to be encouraged by the work that you're doing out there. So we please ask that if you have um, some stories you'd like to share, to go ahead and send it to us. And we're gonna give you some information how to do that towards the end of this session. Next slide. So many of you are aware that there was the launch of the Wash Fit, what we call 2.0 or the second edition. And that was released just a few weeks to months ago. Um, but what you may not realize is there was also a release of several supplemental or complementary resources for WASH uh, FIT. And so what you see here are some of the other items that really you have access to. So that includes the WASH uh, FIT assessment in the COBOL toolbox for digital data collection. There are lots of technical fact sheets on climate, equity, hand hygiene that can be very useful to you. There are training slides as well as a manual associated with the launch. Uh, Lindsay just dropped the um, link in the chat if you've not already uh, visited or um, seen the new WashFit tool. Now, if you're using WashFit 1, you're not wrong, okay? So this is not a um, completely different tool. It's really a tool that has additional components that have been added to it around climate and equity, uh, gender uh, responsive wash. And so um, if you're using 1.0 or the very first one, you're fine. It would behoove you to look at 2.0 to see some of the newer features. And then of course, take advantage of some of these supplementary or complementary resources. And what's coming soon, Lindsay has let me know, is uh, some pre-recorded videos, so short videos that will help, again, explain WashFit and some of the additional features that are with uh, the newest version. And so next slide. With that, I will pass it over to Lindsay, who's going to give us a bit of a... Great, so fantastic to join you all. Looking forward to this conversation. Um, so I am going to um, start with an overview of what data is available for WASH and healthcare facilities. And so if you have taken a look at the practical steps document, you may be familiar with this table that is in the back of the document. Um, Haley might be able to drop in the chat the link to this uh, document if you're unfamiliar with it, but it lists the type of tools you may be using. For example, of course, we talked about WASH fit just now. There's an assessment tool with WASH, wash fit, but there is also um, the clean clinic approach, FACET, wash con, wash and clean, teach clean. So a number of assessment tools. In addition to um, health management information systems where you may collect data um, at a national level through the government, there are large scale facility assessments like the SPA, and you may have your own program monitoring tools. So in all these, you may be already collecting your data um, and have a pile of data that you are sitting on in a database. 
But the question today is really about what else can you do with this data? Um, in many cases, I know organizations use it for their own program or project level imp implementation. So monitoring, identifying, identifying facility needs, et cetera. But there are other ways you can use your data and that's really what we wanna talk about today. And so it may involve engagement with other organizations, whether that's laterally or upstream um, to share information and make sure that you are not uh, duplicating efforts. It may be used for policymaking and we'll hear about an experience uh, today about um, Washington healthcare facility data to shape policymaking. It may be uh, used for advocacy, uh, similar, but again, it might depend where you sit. You may be in a better position to advocate with the data that you are working with. And you may use it for budget or resource allocation, whether that's within a specific set of facilities or districts or at a national or state level. And I think it's worth noting where you sit will really impact how you use the data. So we will talk today from a very varying perspectives, um, but keeping in mind that much of this work can be do done at different levels. Um, you don't have to only advocate at the national level, you can advocate subnationally with your data. Um, so we really wanna think about the varying ways that your data can be put to use. And so I'm actually going to take a pause here and open up a poll before we move on to our presentations, uh, because I'm curious how many of you all have data. So I'll go ahead and launch this poll. The questions here are, have you collected Washington Healthcare Facilities data? Do you have data available? And secondarily, if you have, how have you put that data to, to use? And you can select as many options as you'd like. And if you select other, I'd be curious in the chat box, if you could just tell us what are other ways you've used their, your data or other options. So take about a minute here to respond. Um, if you are on a phone, I know sometimes it's hard to respond to the polls on the phone. Feel free to drop your thoughts in the chat. And most of what we'll talk, to, talk about today is what you, else you can do with your data, but it's worth thinking about if you haven't collected or maybe you'll be collecting data again in the future, how you might adjust what you collect based on these other actions. Um, so there may be a, a potential to ask a few more questions on your program assessments that could help shape advocacy, for example. Um, if you, um, I'm not saying you need a whole new assessment for this, but there might be ways to shape it. So we're thinking about that in this process. Um, looks like people are still responding, so I'll give you another 20 seconds. And Joanne, you'll have to tell me what you see in the chat because I can't see it right now. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and close it in five, four, three, two, one. Great. Ending the poll, and I'll share the results. So it looks like the majority of you do have data that you are, you have a database available on Washington healthcare facilities. 78% said you do have data. What's interesting is what you've used your data for. Um, now apologies if you're not being able to see this on your screen. Joanne, is it sharing? Yes, yes, I can see it. Okay, so apologies if not, but I will read through the results here. Um, how have you put the data to use? Many of you are using it for project and program implementation. If you work for a nonprofit, that's not surprising. That's how many of us use it. And we'll actually hear from someone on um, data for implementation today and learn about how they're doing it, but then how they've expanded that work. 26% uh, are engaging with other organizations, either bilaterally or upstream. I didn't mention downstream because that's usually part of program imp implementation. A few are using it for policymaking, 17%. A lot of you are advocating, that's great. 37% or a third of you are using it for advocacy or influencing as well. The same number using it for budgeting or resource allocation. And uh, quite a few of you are using it for other. Joanne, do you see any comments in the other? I have not, but feel free while Lindsay is, is going on to go ahead and tell us what is it that you're using your data for if you have chosen other? Because that would be really good for us to see. Yeah, and what I, I want to take a second here before we, we transition to our presenters, uh, take a moment in the chat. If you are not using your data for any of these purposes, what is one way you'd like to use your data, but you aren't currently doing so? So take 60 seconds, drop in the chat. Uh, maybe this has inspired you about something, and maybe there's something that we haven't even thought of um, that you can help contribute.
So ways in which you could use your data. Okay, so data to showcase the burden of disease. So we have one person who has shared that. So really showing you the, the magnitude of the problem. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on how else you might use your data now that we've given you some ideas? quality improvement mm -hmm. sure. to monitor. So IPC in particular, to make the case to funders, to show impact. Someone is saying it would be great to use our data to influence donor funding priorities. So that's a really good suggestion there. Any other thoughts before we, before we move to our panel? Link of the data to the trend of decreasing the number of cases of diseases. So whether you're seeing the, the, that trend through data, a de decrease of, of whatever diseases you're following, impactfulness, using it for root cause analyses, sharing it with patients, staff to help them demand improvements. Really great idea there. For training, so data being used for actual training needs or needs assessments potentially, great. Fantastic. Well, feel free to put more thoughts in. Perhaps this will inspire you. Um, I am going to, before we pass on to our speakers, Joanne, I will drop in the chat a link. Um, there is a presentation on data for action at a national level with HMIS um, from Dr. Mary Ashino from the Ghana Health Services. Um, because she is often presenting this, I didn't ask her to present it again today, but I do have a recording of a 20 minute presentation if you all are interested on data uh, for policy making and monitoring um, that I will share. But let's in the meantime, Joanne, turn to our speakers. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. And thank you for framing it. And really thank you for participating in that poll to give us a sense of who's with us in the audience today. But without further delay, I wanna turn over to our um, three sets of panelists that we have here um, with us that's really going to talk through the different ways that data is being used. And so we're gonna start off with data for policymaking. And we're joined by Mr. Ifan Durrani, uh, WASH officer from UNICEF Pakistan uh, office uh, in Islamabad. And so I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Mr. Durrani, to go ahead and take us through. Thank you so much, Joanna and Lindsay. Um, uh, so maybe because uh, the presentation will be, uh, you will run or, um, uh, yeah, thank you so much. So, um, the picture in here you see is uh, like the three picture on one side. Uh, this was taken from a DHO office and it shows the state of WASH and IPC in the health system of Pakistan. And uh, on, the, on the right side, you, you see um, uh, a healthcare facility where um, some WASH facility is being provided to, the, to that. And um, I think there is a lot of efforts required um, and a lot of resources required to bring that quality change in the health system, and which cannot be achieved if uh, both WASH and health work in isolation. So, so my presentation here um, is that how we use the data that we get uh, from the detailed assessment in the healthcare facilities for our policy, uh, for, for different programs that we do. So um, I'll just give an overview of it. Uh, next, please. Thank you so much. So uh, just for the audience to um, uh, get to know what uh, is the overall profile of Pakistan uh, in terms of healthcare facility. So uh, from this slide, 91% of the healthcare facilities are primary, uh, which are called the non-hospitals and uh, only 9% of them is the hospital. So a great number of these, uh, um, these primary healthcare facilities are unutilized. Um, so you can have a BHU, RHC, dispensary, mother and child health centers, and TB centers. So uh, this is just to give you a profile. Next, please. Uh, the a work that we just recently uh, completed was uh, a scoping study. Um, and the, uh, the objective of this scoping study was to um, assess the status of WASH in healthcare facilities. Uh, it was to, uh, because it's 
there are three ways. Um, these are the additional questionnaires that we uh, we have in the WashFit. We have uh, tried to get uh, did this in consultation with our stakeholders to find out uh, the different needs of the program. So uh, this is one part of it. The second is to generate the baseline for monitoring of SDGs and uh, reporting to SDGs. And thirdly, uh, the most important part was to identify the bottlenecks to uh, improve wash in healthcare facilities. So uh, this total data collection process, we did a, a, a healthcare facility assessment in almost uh, 2000 healthcare facilities. Uh, what we did is that we, we uh, customized the wash fit tool uh, to the Pakistan context. And we did this assessment through a, th a third party um, across all the, prov through a provincially representative samples. Um, so the, in this sample, like this was helped out to us by the National Bureau of Statistics, who, um, because there were different stakeholders which were involved uh, in this process, uh, Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Climate Change, National Bureau of Statistics, Provincial Education, to Provincial Health Departments, and other key stakeholders like WHO and uh, Health, uh, Health Services Academy. So, uh, so the overall sample, it was um, more of like 132. Uh, there are total 160 districts in Pakistan. And out of that, uh, this study was conducted in almost 132 uh, districts. Um, next, please. So uh, this is just uh, the results of the, of the uh, baseline that we did for Pakistan. And in here, like you see that number of the uh, in terms when we go to water, 74% of the uh, health facilities have adequate water available. But there is a big disparity among provinces, just like Balochistan, which is a water scarce area here um, in primary healthcare facilities, 51% facility do not have adequate water. Additionally, to achieve the safely managed uh, uh, water, uh, water quality testing and monitoring is a huge challenge. And only 16% of the facilities are reported to be regularly monitoring the water quality aspect. Um, in, when we talk about the uh, um, basic uh, sanitation services, although that 100% facilities have toilet available, but as many as 24% of the uh, toilet units are non-functional. Only 33% have gender segregated toilets and 18% have, um, have facility for physically challenged people, which make it 92% under limited service and only 8% facilities have basic services. On hand hygiene, around 31% facilities uh, do not have hand hygiene services, both in, in toilets and in, in uh, and near services, 15% have limited services where functional hand washing station is available, uh, either in a toilet or in service area. Soap is um, like one of the basic thing which is lacking in primary healthcare facilities, like 31% of them compared to secondary, which is 51% of the healthcare facilities. Uh, so around 54% of the um, like uh, facilities have the basic hand hygiene services. Uh, on the healthcare waste management, again, uh, like only 14% of uh, the facilities have basic services uh, because some of them are practicing this solid waste segregation, but there is a, a big uh, lack of the uh, um, its proper disposal. So only 55% facilities, um, like uh, as many as 55% facilities lack this uh, uh, waste management services. Uh, coming to the uh, basic environment cleaning services, only 33% have basic service where cleaning on schedule and regular inspection is being done by the sanitary inspector in the facility, in the facility or the facility in charge. Despite the availability of the sanitary work and, and cleaning material, 26% uh, observed um, of the observed um, facilities have limited environmental cleaning, and in around 39% facilities there is no services. So uh, you see, like this this situation, uh, this all came from the from the assessment that we we conducted, 
and it like uh, it helped us like what are the gaps and where are the areas we need to to work on um uh, uh, next please uh if you click on all the uh, yeah 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 one more thank you so uh this just show us the journey um of uh, wash and ipc in pakistan uh, because we initially started this stakeholder consultation in 2019 um, because uh, it was noticed that there is no uh, no available study available in Pakistan at that time. So uh, after detailed de deliberation with all the stakeholders, we initiated this scoping study for which I have given you the results of it. Uh, so in 2020, 20 and 2021 we 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 um, uh, we completed this whole study we took almost two years uh, it was the covid time that's why it, it was de uh, delayed uh, but now what we are doing we are now um, using this uh, study um, as a basis uh, uh, to develop our provincial strat provincial and national strategy we are also developing or standards and training manuals um, um, based on the findings because it also give us like um, the, 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 the way uh, that each, because it was a provincial representative sample. So we now know uh, exactly the situation in each provinces. So they will be developing their strategies and then um, um, they will be uh, working on um, developing scale, scalable models. Um, um, so uh, we are trying that uh, we now do some revision in the DHIS2 um, and we include the wash indicators uh, in, in that part. So this is this is something that we are planning. Next, please. So um, the wash data that, as I mentioned, that this was this was. Uh, hello. Am I audible? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this wash data that we have, um, uh, because it has a, a, a good number of information on each and every program that is currently, whether it's newborn or maternal health, um, or whether it's on the EPI, or it whether it's with COVID, or um, even our own programs that we do. So we have this whole lot of data with us, which we can use and we are using for our, our upcoming um, like, uh, policies and strategies or standards. So we have, um, and what we do is that we, we, we the approach to us that uh, for this whole process is that we do it in consultation with the provincial governments. Um, so we engage them, we use this data for, for, for our advocacy and then um, um, then the agreeing them um, to work on the quality of care in Pakistan. So currently um, we have, um, uh, uh, we are doing it first for Punjab and then we'll uh, replicate it for the rest of the rest of the provinces and at national level. Uh, next please. So um, the uh, recommendation, or maybe the actions that uh, we would like to, I would like to you to uh, look at is that because government do not function without data, um, because this is um, data is the key for all ad advocacy at all level. Um, because until, unless we have good data, uh, which uh, we it it is very difficult for the government to pursue for action. So um, that is the first thing. Second is that with planning uh, um, to report to JMP, it's a chance to also consider additional indicators for specific wash and IPC needs. Uh, as I mentioned that you can use this data for our, your different program like uh, RMNCH, uh, COVID or EPI. So uh, if there are countries who, who want to undertake, um, like do the wash fit in all the, uh, like, um, an overall assessment in the healthcare facility. So for, for them, it's like um, recommended that they also consider it. Uh, thirdly, the stakeholder consultation, um, uh, because it's again, like uh, it's the center of our approach uh, because without this stakeholders consultation, this study would have not been done, especially in Pakistan, because um, 
we in Pakistan, it's um, it's um, uh, after uh, 2010, like provinces are on their own to to um, to do the work on the healthcare facilities or improvement of the healthcare facility. So working with them is central part. So um, next, I think that's the end of my slides, and uh, I'll be happy to have questions or any queries or that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Again, this is Mr. Irfan Durrani um, from the UNICEF Pakistan office. Thank you so much for your presentation and the recommendations that you've set for us. Just in the interest of time, I'm gonna ask if you have questions for Mr. Durrani, please go ahead and start placing them in the chat. We're going to preserve time towards the end of the presentations for some questions and answers and more discussion. But just because we wanna make sure we get to all of our panelists, I'm gonna go ahead and shift to the next um, panelist who's going to talk with us about data for implementation. And so this is Mr. Sam Agon. Um, monitoring and Evaluation Advisor from Japaigo, Uganda. And Mr. Gong, please go ahead, take it away. Thank you very much, Johan. Yes, my name is Sam Ogon from Uganda. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening, depending where you are. Yes, allow me to put off my video. My connectivity is a bit poor so that I reserve my bandwidth. Yes, we are, I'm going to take us through about the implementation and monitoring. Looking at our one program that we ran called uh, Momentum Global and Country Leadership. This program was implemented in five countries with purpose or goal of ensuring to de deliver essential health services during COVID-19 pandemic. So this was implemented, like I said, in five countries and we'll go over them and we go deep into Uganda. Next slide, please. So the main objective was to rapidly improve healthcare facility wash services in the five countries. And these five countries included Bangladesh, India, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and Uganda. So the program ran from September 2020 to September 2021 in the other four countries. But Uganda moved ahead up to May 2021. That was implementation, though we are now closing the project end of this month. So there were key technical approaches that we used. One, strengthening health facility infection prevention readiness. And secondly, looking at wash focus quality improvement, prioritizing four measurable wash improvement aims to drive improvements. And looking at virtual QI capacity building where we are mentoring district QI for persons to go ahead and mentor facility staff. Next slide, please. So in the two phases that we use for implementation, phase one, we're looking at improving healthcare facility infection prevention readiness, where we made some minor repairs or rehabilitation to support healthcare facility wash and sanitation hygiene. So here we made minor repairs. Let's talk about the latrine, the maternity, as long as water supplies, as long as it addresses IPC wash. So we reached 74 facilities, which is 48% of the total facilities that we saw previously. Two, we distributed uh, essential infection prevention and control commodities. This included PPEs, soap, or gloves, among others. And also promoted global guidance document. This is where all the lists of IPC essential supplies are documented. So now facilities are able to look through and request basing on this list. Next slide, please. 
So in for us to measure progress of phase one activities, MCGL created a common IPC readiness tool. And this readiness tool was standard across all the facilities, regardless of the level or the authority of management. So this tool was used at baseline and end line with a 100 point scale as listed uh, here. Looking at COVID-19 screening up to healthcare facility policies and strategies. Next slide, please. So in phase two, after now looking at there was a little improvement in IPC readiness by from the initial uh, provision of infrastructure rehabilitation community support given, MCGL began to implement a second strategy, which was aimed at establishing quality improvement system to identify IPC risks and priorities through data that were generated. So these were using both um, through training in what we call hub and spoke. Now in the hub and spoke, hub is where the key subject matter experts are formed and they were the trainers, training people who are in health, small health facilities who are now like spokes on IPC wash. Next slide, please. So in phase two, we designed and identified four common priority areas for improvement aims. The first one, looking at percentage of health facility staff who adhere to mask protocol. Secondly, we are looking at percentage of individuals screened for COVID-19 upon arrival. So B would look at the visitors, look at health uh, care workers, look at the patient themselves, and see percentage of health facility staff who comply with an hygiene protocol during interaction with patients. And finally, looking at cleaning routines, where now you are concentrating at the cleaners, do they clean the door knobs, the, the, the light switches? So through all this, we are doing observational method of data collection, where you sit and look through whether all these are being done. So we also maintain high healthcare facility wide and what IPC readiness score. What we show, uh, we, uh, we saw later before, that structure was being done and tracked on a monthly basis. And also towards the end of the project, we did what we call most significant change stories, where we go and sit with the facility staff and ask them what they consider as the most significant change. And each one of them would write their story. And at the end of the day, they sit together to agree on two and those stories help us to triangulate the quantitative data that we are collecting. Next slide, please. Now, I want to make a summary of these so many boxes, but this is the digital data management tool that we were using. We were using Saltis or MWater, where now it was the tool developed adapted from Ministry of Health, and then we used, and finally, is now bringing us data in the system. When the tool was from the requests from healthcare providers, because many times they do their normal work, but documentation picking this data is challenging. So when we started implementing the MCGL, uh, a program. We use this M water and they got amazed with the dashboards with how they can see consoles are produced. So they asked MCGL to build their capacity so that they can have this data readily available. 
So this work was done. We started by consulting the Ministry of Health. If they're in agreement, they gave us that draft tool. We incorporated some project um, question in it and got one tool that was developed in MWater. And we trained the district staff, we trained healthcare providers to be able to pick that at their facilities and then the district staff to support them in analysis. So now as we talk, this tool is now given to the, their facilities and they are collecting data that comes through up to the subnational level. Next slide, please. Now, if you could go to that go.saltis.wal slash Ministry of Health underscore Uganda, you will see what is on the right hand side. It will open up and you have console for Ministry of Health, where if you click, you're able to look at different performance of facilities, but at the central level. While on the right hand side, you have healthcare facility staff. So now there, the healthcare facility home pay. At the facility level, you are able to click and look at your performance, basing on all the indicators that you are collecting data on. Next slide, please. Now, the data, like I said, we had baseline and end line. So baseline data help us to prioritize what uh, IPC items we needed to, to procure. Looking at IP, uh, PPE, looking at the soap, looking at the mask, the glove, mention them. So it's because of the data that we use to help us do it. Secondly, even to identify the facilities that needed minor repairs, IPC, wash repair. We were not constructing, not putting new construction building, no. What was there, for example, uh, washrooms are not having running water, we go and help them fix that. Where they have uh, latrines are not working, we go help them put it right. Where they have maternity is leaking, we go fit the, uh, fix that. So it's because of the data that we collected that help us to prioritize that. Next, in form key areas of mentorship. Yes, as we are continuously collecting data on a monthly basis, the, this data is first reviewed at facility level on a monthly basis, because at each of these facilities, we have IPC committees who sit and look at the, their performance as a facility. So now this pointed out the gaps, for example, on the cleaners that they didn't know how to clean. So they were trained on how to clean on basic IPC um, standards. Three, community sensitization efforts on COVID. So because of this data, it also helped the local leaders to go talk about the COVID in the community. And I think that was a good pointer in helping to reduce uh, COVID infections. Two, uh, next is quality improvement projects and behavioral change at healthcare facility level. As we were collecting data, these people were making their quality improvement projects. And basing on the data, because you look at your graphs in the dashboard and the performance is not very good. So you come up with your projects that you keep following, following basing on those four aims that I shared earlier. Also it has helped us cross country learning of sharing best practices because we are in five countries, not only in Uganda, but this was helping us to share what we are doing here, what Bangladesh is doing, and so on. Next slide, please. Mr. Ogon, if you can take two more minutes for us. Yes, uh, I'm about to finish. Yes, here we were looking at uh, sepsis related to pregnancy. And I wanted to point out two things. One, 
We look at this at district level in Uganda, but also looking at contribution and performance of MCGL vis-a-vis -vis the district. Next slide, please. Now, here we are looking at general across the five countries, looking at the GMP, those five uh, areas, water, sanitation, hygiene, waste management, and environmental cleaning. We note that environmental cleaning, we perform very well from 19, from 13% to 63%. So that was our biggest improvement. Next slide, please. Here now we are comparing the baseline and end line, and we are collecting data and the analysis we looked at the lowest score, the medium, the average, and the highest. And we see generally for all the five countries, the average score was 72 from 50. That was 22% point uh, improvement. Next slide, please. Some recommendation. In Uganda, I think the IPC wash data is very scanty. So we are saying now using this digital tool is helping providers to collect data. And this data is accessible to all stakeholders, which would help to advocate for resources and also to have this system run uh, across the country. Invest in technology. Yes, when we talk about digital data, now we need to talk about the phones, we need to talk about the laptops. So that is an area that we need to invest in. Engage all stakeholders. Yes, we saw the first presentation, we had Kobo, here MCGL is coming up with M Water. So I think there are so many things now we need to bring them together and then we move forward. Designate and build, yes, build capacity at a local level so that they are able to analyze their data, they are able to use their data, because when they collect data and they know it is for those people, then they are not going to use that data. It will just be a routine. And then review the data constantly, because the moment you project graph, somebody will even ask why is one shorter than the other. So that is already the beginning of data use. So we should encourage this. Next slide, please. Yes, I, I want to acknowledge uh, USID mission, district, momentum staff, partners, and everybody. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. This is Mr. Sam Ongom uh, from Japago, Uganda. Thank you so much for taking us through the steps as well as the results of your uh, project under the data for implementation. Really appreciate these recommendations. And I will say as someone who also appreciates qualitative data, I was most impressed with the, the most significant change stories that you added um, to your data collection process. So this is all very good. And just in the interest of time, we want to make sure we uh, leave enough space for Mr. Suleimana Mamane, who is the WASH Associate Director from World Vision Niger. And Mr. Mamane will help us understand data for research as well as for advocacy. So again, if you have not already, please go ahead and choose your preferred um, language under the interpretation bar because Mr. Mamane will be uh, providing uh, their uh, presentation in French. So if you need to listen in a different language, please go ahead and do so. Mr. Mamane, I, I hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good uh, morning, everyone. Bonjour. Donc, uh, Hello, everyone. As you said, uh, I'm going to present in French. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity to share. As you said, I'm Sudimana Amana. I'm uh, Voilà. Um, donc, uh, je vais aussi fermer ma vidéo. So, uh, I 
I'm going to also turn off my video uh, to save bandwidth uh, so that we won't have any connection problems. Next slide, please. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the background or context. Everything uh, began with an observation in 2018. Uh, you can see that the situation in terms of access uh, into wash services in general. Uh, uh, less than 50% of the uh, Niger population had access to drinking water in 2018, and less than 10% uh, in rural areas had access uh, any, to any basic sanitation services. Uh, now, uh, based on this observation, we initiated a program, a project, uh, with the support and funding from the Hilton Foundation in the US through World Vision US. There was an initiative uh, to uh, evaluate access to watch services in Niger in uh, the communes of Teodi and Makalondi. We did this assessment to uh, determine what the situation was. Subsequently, we uh, emphasized access to wash services in healthcare facilities. Uh, again, with the support of the Hilton Foundation uh, and World uh, Vision US. We were able to start a project in cooperation with WHO, CDC, and IRC. So we initiated a project which began with a, an evaluation of the real situation at the departmental or district level in the communes of Dorodi and Makalondi. So we did that assessment in 2020 and on uh, subsequently, we took a number of uh, steps uh, in order to change the situation, both in the target communes and at the national level. So the project was implemented with a number of uh, uh, interventions, both at the national level and the local level. Next slide, please. So uh, the objective of today's presentation is to focus on uh, the actions taken, but just uh, by way of reference, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to give you a few indicators that reflect the situation as it was when we did the study. For instance, 19% uh, of the health centers had access to uh, drinking water, 5% uh, to basic sanitation. And you can see the various figures. I won't take a lot of time for that uh, because the information is there. This is the result uh, of our baseline assessment uh, thanks to the project under the leadership of the CDC to determine what the situation was at the departmental level. Next slide, please. So we uh, juxtaposed, we had, we had uh, existent data, GMP data, because as I said, our assessment was limited to two communes out of uh, over 200 in the country. So to have an idea what existed at the national level, we referred to the GMP uh, assessment uh, that you're familiar with, undoubtedly. And that gives us an overview of the situation for the same indicators at the national level. And when you uh, look at, the, at this information, you can see that the situation is quite similar to uh, what we saw in the intervention areas that we had targeted, pretty much similar. Again, we won't take a lot of time on the figures. 
uh, we can move on to the next slide. As I said, on the basis of the results of the evaluation that we undertook and looking at the situation of the country uh, uh, at the GMP data level, we, uh, we had a project which was uh, supported and funded by the Hilton Foundation, was a project uh, that aimed at uh, of changing the situation in uh, the Dorodi and Macaroni communes in order to change the situation, but also to influence what was going on nationally, uh, feigning our any ability to act at the national level. Uh, it, we we uh, felt it important to act locally to have uh, influence nationally. Uh, we'll go into the you know, detail of the actions in the field, but the health services in the two co-commons were systematically work with to uh, develop uh, their influence, their infrastructures for access to water, uh, hygiene, uh, capacity building of the various uh, local in, uh, people um, involved and the health authorities. So there was a whole range of interventions which uh, evolved and continue to evolve because the initiative continues until 2023. Uh, in order to change things concretely in these two communes, and in fact, we're in the process of doing an, a, a midway assessment uh, in this same region with the support of CDC. Now to come back uh, to, and this is in line with uh, today's theme, we're going to focus on what's being done at the national level to uh, influence, uh, as I said, policies and to do advocacy. Uh, there are a certain number of actions, uh, there are quite a few of them here in the list, uh, but I'm going to focus on a few of them. Uh, now, with the uh, support of initiatives in uh, hygiene at the national level, we sought to share the information for the national partners, national centers, under the leadership of the uh, WHO and the Ministry of uh, Public Health. We uh, succeeded in having an influence over the authorities because a task force was set up for uh, Washington healthcare facilities, uh, which is a permanent forum for discussion on all issues re relating to WASH in uh, healthcare settings. Uh, subsequently, uh, once implementation began in the field, we also set up a technical working group, uh, uh, WASHVIC technical working group, which, uh, which is under the uh, uh, ages of, of the of public health missions to make WashFit an integral part of strategies to implement uh, WASH in healthcare. So there's a WashFit a working group or task group uh, uh, that uh, brings all of the actors together and meets uh, periodically to discuss uh, progress uh, uh, nationally in the policies and in the information system, uh, health information management system. So uh, in regions where the project is not directly present, uh, there has been impact on actors, the people who are in charge uh, in the various regional oh. entities under uh, the umbrella of the uh, Ministry of Health. They've received some training so that they can start changing the citizens by implementing the WashFit uh, approach in healthcare facilities. Uh, with the support of WHO and consultants, uh, there was an effort to contextualize or adapt WashFit tool uh, on the basis of Niger realities. WashFit uh, is one thing, but uh, we're at different levels of services and standards uh, 
depending on whether in, in a city or in the countryside. So it's important to be able to uh, take uh, local realities into account. There's the progressive in integration of WASH indicators into Niger's health information system. On the basis of the WASHFIT implementation, uh, indicators have been identified and that weren't necessarily already part of Niger's health information center. They weren't being uh, systematically monitored and now they are taken into considerations and uh, agents who are on in the field in uh, the HFFs are being trained on the indicators and the system is uh, being uh, revamped to take uh, this information into account at the national level, because we know that the decisions are made by public authorities on the basis of authorized health information uh, systems uh, that have been approved by the government. So nobody can uh, have an effect on these systems uh, or on the decisions unless you go through these indicators that are incorporated into the system and uh, that are monitored on a regular basis. So there is a, a ongoing work uh, under uh, ESA, which is a strategy for uh, <clears throat> advocacy in uh, the uh, health uh, environment. And we are preparing a sharing meeting with the parliamentaries there is a network for WASH, and we're going to share with them those uh, that data and all of the strategies uh, that we have with them, uh, hoping that they can influence uh, because they're the ones who uh, make the law. So maybe that could help. And so there's also work that's ongoing to finalize the referential of all of the uh, material and equipment that uh, are necessary uh, for individual protection in uh, the health environment. So a lot of things are on their way and they will continue um, until the end of this project. And until then, we think that uh, all of this can be integrated in these strategies and national policies and thus influence the uh, intervention approaches from all of the actors. So that's what we can say now for the actions that are ongoing on the national level. And on the next slide. Mr. Mamane, if you will, can you take one more minute? Okay, very good. Okay. So in terms of recommendations, um, what we were able to do up to now, uh, it's always important to create the conditions for uh, data sharing and experience sharing uh, at the national level and central level with all of the key actors. So, to, you know, uh, cr create a, a framework for a permanent exchange. So we have regular meetings right now at the global and uh, monthly meeting where we uh, get an update of what all of all the partners are doing in, in the context of this process. And it's important to also ensure that the uh, state authorities take the lead if the state doesn't take the lead, it's always very hard to um, implement changes in policies and strategies. And also, we want to ensure that the means uh, are provided for the operation of the exchange frameworks that's created. <clears throat> so there's a lot of work that needs to be done and also to create the conditions to get feedback uh, from the field. Um, at the national level, so that can also be shared with the key actors uh, within the context of those discussions. Thank you very much. Last slide. Thank you. And that was Mr. Soleimana Mamane from World Vision Niger. Thank you so very much for taking us through and sharing with us how you've been using your data for advocacy. And thank you to all of our panelists who have joined us today for sharing their work and showing those linkages of how, what data for action looks like at different levels, in different uh, areas, different sectors. Um, so now we have a few moments and this is great because we'd like to open up the floor first. If there are any questions for any of the panelists, if you haven't already, please go ahead and place those in the chat so that we can have an opportunity to direct those to our, to our um, esteemed guests. But then we also want to create some time in the few moments we have for you all as a group to share with us what you are doing, if you have examples of 
data for implementation, data for advocacy, data for research, um, or data, um, as we talked about in the very beginning, for policy or policy making to go ahead and start sharing that with us. I do want to call on one individual who uh, we know is with us, Katie Sill from Global Water Challenge. If you are here, if you can just unmute and share with us about a new data exchange platform. So go ahead, Katie. Okay, great. I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, well, first, thank you to the fantastic presentation. This was such an exciting uh, webinar to hear, you know, data really being used to shape decisions and, and make change. Um, just very briefly, I wanted to share a little bit about a new initiative that Global Water Challenge is leading, which is focused on kind of taking the data together. And I think actually a few of the presenters mentioned this, like sharing data, compiling data, bringing it all together so we have a better understanding of the landscape. Um, this effort is the, the WASH and Healthcare Facilities Data Exchange. Um, and the goal is really to take all of the data that different organizations and governments and academics are collecting and compile it into a common resource. So that can be used for research, it can be used for decision-making. Um, and we actually plan to kind of develop some decision-making tools um, that would give, you know, you know, first off, a better understanding of the landscape, um, but second off, you know, uh, prioritization. How do we know where to work? Where do we try and prioritize resources? I think a few folks mentioned those types of concepts early on in the discussion. This work is built on the WaterPoint data exchange, which we've been running now for, gosh, about eight years. And that, that platform takes WaterPoint data. So, you know, is it a, um, a pump or a tap stand? you know, and, and is it working, is it not working, and collects that data from NGOs, from governments, and brings it together, so all of a sudden you're looking at a more complete picture. And I think that this type of initiative could be very useful here where more and more folks are gathering data um, on healthcare facilities, but there still seems to be, you know, not a full understanding of, of the whole picture. And so we will hope to actually maybe report back to this group. We've developed a, a standard, which we would love to share and, and collect feedback very much aligned with JNP and WashFit as uh, I think the, the, the direction is going. Um, but we are hoping to kind of collect uh, you know, data from, from groups such as the organizations that are here on this call. Um, I'll throw my information in the, in the chat, but if you have data, if you're interested in maybe kind of piloting with us, kind of being a study partner of how your data might look in a platform like this, what types of decisions we could support, um, please, please reach out. Um, it would be wonderful to connect. Great, thank you so much, Katie, for letting us know about that. And Katie's gonna put some additional information in the chat, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, we had a question that came up and maybe we can try to get one of our panelists, Misty, maybe Mr. Ongun from uh, Chapaigo. Uh, there was a question where a person would like to know, how does WASH fit compare with M Water? If you have some experiences that you could share on that question. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, M water is an application that uh, MCGL was using for data collection. Now it brings together the tool, the wash fit, the indicators from MOH, the project indicators together. And then now we feed in to the M water and then that is what we are using for data collection. I hope I was clear. Great, thank you so much. Mr. Agum, do we have any other questions? I see some chat correspondence going on. We have about two more minutes. Maybe we had just one more question, whether in the chat or if someone wants to quickly unmute, unmute you can ask it yourself. All right, so we have some oh, Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Ogum, go ahead. Would you like to make a comment? Thank, yes, no, no. I, I, I wanted, uh, there was some requests for, for M water tool. Yes, I'm going to put my email here so that we can carry on the conversation and we see how we can support you. Perfect, Over. perfect. And again, we encourage anyone else, if you have some 
uh, data related projects that you are involved in that you would like to have some collaboration or some conversation, please go ahead and start placing some of that in the chat. We're coming near to the end of our time together. Uh, there we go, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Ongum has placed his email in the chat um, from Chipaigo, Uganda, for anyone who wants to continue talking uh, with him about his, his programs. I'm sorry, is there a Good question? morning. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. I want to introduce myself. I'm Mr. Ortiz from Pajo, from the regional area. We are based in Lima, Peru. In the chat, I shared a document, an assessment document that we did here in America, for WASH, in, in healthcare facilities. And there, there's material to support different health centers to support them, such an example in Honduras. I'm placing this document on the chat. It's a document that will be launched in these following weeks so everyone can really read it more carefully. So it's been a pleasure to be able to be able to share here with all these different regions of the world. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. Thank you so much for that resource. That is going to be very helpful to us. Um, and with that, just to keep us on time, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Haley to go ahead and uh, close up. But please, if you still have questions, thoughts, comments, keep using the chat box so that your colleagues can see uh, some of your contributions. Thank you, everyone. Great big thank you to our panelists for your um, experiences and coming and sharing with us as a community. We're so very grateful to you. And now I'm going to pass it over to Haley. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Joanne. Um, Lindsay, if you can share the last slide, um, I'm going to touch base quickly just on ways that we can get involved um, or ways that the audience members can get more involved. Um, great. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so the first thing is that you can actually subscribe to our listserv. Um, so I just put a, a Google form link in the chat. Um, if you want to receive different updates on the community of practice, um, on, on events uh, and resources, um, you know, follow-up items from either um, this call or previous calls, um, feel free to, to subscribe to the listserv. Um, we send out monthly newsletters um, and constant information about updates within the sector. So um, that's a great way to just stay kind of on the pulse of what's happening with Washington Healthcare Facility news um, and events. Um, the second one, kind of as Lindsay preluded in the beginning of this uh, session, um, we're always interested to, to learn and want to hear what recommendations on different topics you, you would like to hear about. Um, we're always trying to brainstorm different uh, live sessions, different discussions, um, different formats of sessions. So if there's a topic um, that you're really eager or yearning to want to learn more about, uh, feel free to let us know um, and we can kind of work to either tailor that discussion uh, based on those topics and recommendations. Um, and then lastly, um, Lindsay kind of highlighted again that, um, that success story from Uganda earlier. Um, if you have a success story, we're always trying to showcase those success stories in our monthly newsletters um, on our website, um, just in different presentations. So if there's a success story that is coming to your mind that you'd love to share and showcase to, the, to those either on the listserv or just within the community of practice, um, you can reach out to us as well and we can showcase that story within the monthly newsletter. Um, and then also moving forward, we try to have live sessions frequently. Um, so our next live session will actually be in September. Um, we're trying to avoid some of the summer holidays and people being on vacation. Um, so we've pushed it out a little bit further just to accommodate for that and um, hopefully have a more um, live discussion um, focusing on the built environment and user-centered design. So if there's an idea that you have um, around, around that, or if you think you would like to be a speaker or no speakers that could be involved in that session, we are all ears. Um, so definitely feel free uh, to, to reach out for that as well. And Lindsay, uh, just put our email in the chat. Um, so for any of these items that I just discussed, um, how to reach out to us, you can use that email. That's wnhcfaction at emory.edu, um, and we will get back to you pretty quickly. Um, but that kind of wraps up our session for today. Again, this is the link to our wash and healthcare facilities.org slash community of practice page. Um, so all of the information that we mentioned 
Um, yep, Lindsay also just put the link in the chat. Um, all of the information regarding the community of practice can be found here, links to previous events, um, and then we'll also upload the recording from this event uh, onto that page as well. So just a good place to check um, all COP news. So um, with that, um, that is the end of our session. So thank you again so much to the speakers and all of the audience participants for joining today. Um, and we will be in touch um, shortly with some follow-up information and links to the recording. So, so thank you all again and, and take care. And especially, thank you so much, Haley, especially the chat resources. So we will send that back out to you because we see a lot of things going on in the chat. So if you need that, we'll send it back out. So please join the listserv if you have not. I thank you all and have a great rest of your day wherever you are connecting from. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you to our speakers. You all were fantastic. Thank you, our speakers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Ongol. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.